CIY. It's my pleasure to welcome Scott O'Hara yeah. back to be with us. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Scott's a homeboy, grew up his whole life in Tuttle in this church. He and his wife uh, worshiped here for a lot of years as well, and uh, they're off doing missionary work in southeastern Oklahoma now, and so uh, he's, great. he's been gracious enough uh, to come and, and to bring our message today, and it's a quite good message because uh, I got to hear it in first service. So I'm going to pray for him uh, before he does that, though. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are and for the way you lead us and the way you instruct us. And, um, and as God is going to tell us, uh, even through pains and suffering, you, you instruct us and you lead us and you're, you, you never leave us, Lord. I just pray over Scott this morning that, uh, Lord, that, uh, that you'd give him clarity. You'd give him uh, uh, recall of all that he wants to say, but mo mostly, Lord, that he would listen to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit would speak through him this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Ooh, round two. Halftime's over. Well, good morning, everyone. I um, was really excited when I got here. The first thing I saw was Legacies. I thought it was really interesting because Legacy is exactly what we're talking about at the church I'm at. So you go from one church that's two hours and 30 minutes away talking about legacy and leaving your legacy and legacy of faith to legacy of your faith here. Um, just magical, I guess, in, in, in a way for me just to see that. I know Mr. Waveman, when I tell him, he'll be like, are you serious? And I'm like, yeah, because he'll think I'm joking. But um, guys, for you that don't know me, uh, Scott O'Hara, like I said, I, I've grown up here pretty much my whole life. Um, got married 7707 at 707. I did that on purpose because it's my college football number, and I thought it'd be easy for me to remember. And uh, so I asked my wife to get married on that day so that I could remember it. Got married over at the old church right across the street, and off and on. We throughout our whole marriage, we've been here. Then God send us off somewhere, and we come back, and we send you know we come back, and so it's just great to see some old friends and some people. Um, you know, you know you're at home when people are making jokes about you right when you walk in. And, you know, the first service, I thought real quickly, I got this thing, and, and I looked at it, and I, and I thought they were messing with me because I thought it said low battery. Because I looked at it, I was like, man, that's low battery already. And I thought maybe it's because I thought I got a loud voice, but really I just didn't know how to read it. It was completely fine, and um, they weren't making a joke on me. But it's great to be here. I'm so thankful to be here today. Um, the last two years, um, we're going to speak today about my last two years and what God's done. And, and our main text today is going to be, if, if you have your Bible, if you got your phones or whatever, is going to be in the book of Job, uh, which in, until today, this will be the second time I've ever preached out of it. The first time was about 30 minutes ago, and this is the second time. Um, but where am I at? What have I done? Basically, uh, currently, I'm the athletic director and head football coach at Tishomingo High School. Uh, I'm starting my 19th year um, of coaching and teaching. Uh, I got that letter this year for you guys, uh, all excited. The state of Oklahoma sent me a letter actually to my wife, and it says, congratulations, Scott O'Hara, you have 17 more years till you can retire. So I was like, all right, got something to look forward to, uh, 17 more years of teaching and coaching. Um, but anyways, that, that's what I'm currently doing. Um, but I'm so glad to be here. Today's message is, is something that's really God's put on my heart. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, it's, a, it's pretty emotional for me. Uh, and, and I want I want to make sure I state this right at the beginning. I want to I want to know that I know that you guys go through things and you guys go through problems and and issues and and things that are overwhelming. And I, I, I don't want to take away from anything that you're going through. This is what God has got me and where I've been in the last two years, and what I've gone through, and in what I feel like God's done to help me get through it. And so I, that's why I bring in this message, so please don't ever think that I think that you, what you're going through doesn't matter, because it does, and it's probably way worse than whatever I've had to go through. So that being said, I want to start with the last two, two years. Would we all agree the last two years probably been up and down? COVID, uh, new president, um, inflation, war in Ukraine, uh, a wall being built, a wall not being built, um, just just the, the unrest, the uncertainty, the cancel co culture that we live in. You can't say this, you can say this. If you say that, you're wrong. They're going to get you. You know, just 
It just seems like the last two years has been very, very, very up and down. Um, and for me, that's kind of where my story starts. Um, two years ago when COVID was in the midst of heavy COVID, um, I, was, I was a head football coach from a town just real close here. And um, as I, I was coaching, it was during COVID, I had got a coaching staff together. When I took the team over, we had 18 kids on the football team. When I took it over that season, we had 60. Uh, we had no booster club when I got there, got a booster club, had about $20,000 in the booster club after four years working there. Um, thought, man, this was going to be the year that we start really kind of seeing some growth on the football team. Uh, my staff had stayed. I had a staff of seven uh, working, and, and things were going going well. Then COVID hit. And, and as you guys all know, um, all the restrictions, all the things that came with COVID, and then on top of it trying to, trying to do a football you know, play football on top of it. Um, for you that work in the education world or, or for you that rely on other people, I rely on 14, 15, 16-year-old students for my job and my livelihood. I rely on the Lukes of the world for my livelihood. Well, what does that mean? I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, we live in a world that they want you to win. They want you to be successful and and and, you know, at the end of the day, you got to get 15, 16, 17-year-old kids to, to perform at a high level. And it now, Tuttle, I mean, that's, you know, it's pretty simple. <laughs> Just walk up and we win. <laughs> Other places, it's not so simple. Um, we'll talk more about that here in a minute. But so during COVID, it hit. And here's what started it all. Um, the, my daughter got sick, got COVID. She had it for one day. She had a temperature for one day. My twin, I have, I have two twin daughters that are 12. And my oldest is 13. She's going into high school. This is how I know you're getting old. I just got these glasses on Friday, and they're bifocals. So I'm still learning how to go up and down because it's blurry, and then it's, it's good. So bear with me today because it's my first time I have to try to read. I don't read very well, so hopefully I can get through this message. But we're, we're coaching through football, and the first thing happens to my daughter. And so back then, if you guys remember, like Eric got to work out of his garage for a few years. And that, during that time, I remember talking to you. You'd be in the garage working because uh, that's where they told him to go work. They told me to go home for 14 days. My daughter had COVID, so I had to go home. I wasn't sick. I didn't feel sick. I wanted to go to work. Um, and, and just, you know, that's just the way the life was. That's how the world was. Couldn't go to work. And what happened was they continued playing football. During the I call the offense I have for a long time. And. And so those two games, we lost. Um, I get back. We had a couple more kids get COVID. And all of a sudden, um, I go to church here. My aunt was sitting second row, second chair. After church was over, you know, we were all in masks. We're all together. We go eat lunch. Um, everything's fine. On Monday, my mom gets a phone call from my aunt. Um, they said they're rushing to the hospital. And five days later, my aunt was dead. She was sitting right there. I was right next to her, and she passed away. Um, during that time, my mom my mom contracted COVID. We had my aunt's funeral. Um, I was close to my aunt and my uncle. My uncle passed away. I was right there when he passed away. I prayed, and after that, he said, I'm, I'm finished, and, and, and he gave his last breath, and, and he passed away. My aunt, you, and you guys that ever had to deal with anybody that went to the hospital during COVID, you couldn't go up there. You couldn't see him. You couldn't do anything. And you really weren't getting a whole lot of updates if, if you had somebody in the hospital. My aunt passes away. We go to the funeral. Uh, my mom gets sick, really sick. My mom's a very stubborn lady, if you know her. Her name is Karen. She is a Karen. She's the original Karen. Um, I can say that now. She's not here with us right now. She, she was here first service. I didn't say that first service. I'm giving you some extra bonuses. Make sure this delete that part. Um, so anyways, my mom, my mom gets sick, and then my, my stepdad gets sick. My stepdad gets so sick, in fact, that I'm the one. My mom says, I'm too sick. Can you come drive your dad, my stepdad, to the hospital? I'm driving my stepdad to the hospital, and he looks at me as I'm driving. He says, I'm not coming out of this thing alive. That's what my stepdad tells him. I almost wrecked. I said, what are you talking about? Like, he was giving up. He was quitting before we even started. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, what, what do you mean quitting? We can't. So, Dad, you can't quit. We've got to get in there, and, and, and we got to fight this thing. Dad's in there for six days, didn't know if he was going to, you know, in and out, kind of the same thing. I mean, literally two weeks before, my, I lost my aunt the same exact way. And I'm thinking, this is going to happen to my stepdad right now. And now my stepdad does make it out. 
praise God, he makes it out, but he has to early retire. He's got an oxygen tank he has to carry with him wherever he goes. Oxygen in the house now, and again, he can't do a whole lot without struggling breathing. Um, for you that have gone through that, you understand. Well, all during that time, football season was still going. They were still continuing. I was out for four weeks during football season. Not because I was sick. I was never sick. But it was because I was around people that were, so they, they quarantined you. By the time I got back to the football team, the season was over. We had, we had lost our last game, didn't go to the playoffs. Season was over. Most of the kids had went to a different sport. This was at the end of November, start of December. We started basketball season, and during that season, because we thought that we didn't know if we were going to finish the basketball season because of COVID, they wanted to do senior night early. Well, my boss at the time, his daughter, which had went to that school her whole entire life, picked me as her most influential teacher coach she'd ever had. Honored, I was there, couldn't believe it. She could have picked anybody else, she picked me. A week later, her dad brings me into the office and says, sorry, but we're going to go in a different direction. You're no longer going to be the head football coach here anymore. Guys, at that moment, I, w- I, was, I was, not only was I shocked, shocked, but I lost it. I didn't know what I did wrong. They didn't say really anything other than we're just going to go in a different direction to me. I felt like I had failed my family. I felt like I had failed everyone, my mom, everybody. I lived a mile away. I lived in the house. I lived in the house that I loved. Um, I had a job that I loved. I had a coaching staff I loved. I had a spray company that was going really well. And I thought everything in my life was great. had the house. Like I said, my house was my dream house. I thought everything was going great. And then all of a sudden, in the shock of the moment, sorry, you're no longer going to do the thing that you love to do, which is coach. And that's what today's sermon's all about. I don't know if I have have it up there, but my 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 sermon's this. A couple of weeks ago, I saw this guy. This was at Tish and Mingo, one of our good gas stations here. Guy makes his own shirt. Not today, Jesus. When you feel like quitting and giving up, when you feel like you've had enough. And this guy was right in front of me, and that's a man that you know that's homemade shirt that he made, and it has been all over me for the last couple of weeks. Of not today, Jesus. What does that mean? What What was this guy think? Like when he made the shirt? Like I mean, I, I just wanted to know. I wanted to pick his brain of what, what you know. Okay, I'm denouncing God, or no, did, you know, I'm choosing not to believe in you today, God. Or what, what, you know, I didn't know. I, all I said was him at the time. I just said, Hey, I hope you have a blessed day. And the guy kind of gruff, you know, little old, you know, and walked off. And I feel like since then, it's like. God's like asked me to dive into this, and I knew Greg asked me to speak, and y'all were at the bottom of the barrel, the last person to ask to speak, and I was I was the only one left, so that's sorry you guys got me um, to speak on, on a holiday weekend, but but I am blessed and honored to be here. So the question of the day is, when you feel like quitting and giving up, when I was told that I was no longer going to be their coach, I didn't know what to do. I went home, and I'll be honest, I cried. I, I, I failed. To, my wife didn't know what was going on. I didn't know anything. I was scheduled a week later to have a massive neck surgery. I played 20 seasons of football, um, and, and, and I was scheduled to have this big, massive surgery. I just got told that I wasn't going to be a coach anymore. Yeah, you can stay and teach if you want, but you won't be the coach anymore. And I was like, that's what I, I mean, love to do. That's what I feel like God's called me to do right now in my life. And I didn't know what I was going to do. Then I have this big surgery. I show up. And again, for you that know during COVID time, you got to go by yourself. This is the biggest surgery I'd ever had in my life. I got a big scar on my neck from it. They put two discs in my neck, the same surgery that Peyton Manning had. So I thought in my head, if, if I get the same surgery Peyton Manning had, I can still do this. I can still throw that ball. Maybe they'll, no, I'm just kidding. This was two years ago. I was dumb. There's no way I could ever play. I was Jason White's backup. I wasn't better than Jason White. So that being said, I'm sitting there, and then I get up there, and they say, hey, by the way, Mr. O'Hara, you need to pay $2,900 for the surgery, which I didn't know about until that morning at 4.30 in the morning when I was there. I didn't know. My surgery was like four and a half hours long. Didn't know anything about it. I just was told that I wasn't going to be the coach anymore, which I knew that was going to be a big pay cut if whatever. I didn't know where I was headed. I didn't know what to do. I broke down again. I had to call my mom, call my wife, and I just said, guys, I, I'm not going to do this. I, I'm not going to have this surgery. I had these two doctors tell me I need to have this surgery. I was like, I'm not going to do it. 
I've been dealing with the pain for 38 years, whatever. I can deal with it. I'll be fine. But I, I don't want to spend this money because I don't know. I don't know where the future holds for me. I was lost. I thought, you know, when you work your whole life and you bust your tail and you work as hard as you can, I felt like two ways you usually get let go or get fired. One way was you did something criminal, you did something really bad, inappropriate, something like that, and they just, boom, sorry, you're gone. And that one's easy. The second one would have been, in my head, I thought was, hey, coach, you need to work on this. Coach, you need to fix this. Coach, you need to change this. Coach, you need to do something. And if you don't do it or you couldn't do it or didn't succeed in doing it, then okay, hey, we tried, you're done, you're out. But that's not what it was. In my opinion, it was, we're going to go in a different direction. And that's all it was. Did I do something wrong? No. We just want to go in a different direction. And if you're a football coach, you've been doing it for a long time, or a coach of any, that word going in a different direction just basically means we're done with you. For you that don't know how that works. That's a polite way of just saying we're going to go in a different direction, go with somebody else. That's where I start. That's where, my, that's where I was falling to my knees. Today's story is about Job. For you that heard it, read it, I told my wife hey, I was, I was going to speak about Job. I've never spoke about Job. Uh, I've never really did a bunch of research on Job before. And then she said, man, that's really tough. And, and if you've ever read Job, the, the beginning's easy to understand. The end's really easy to understand. And if you're in the middle of Job, it's really hard because it's poetry. And I didn't do very well in English uh, and, and reading and all that kind of stuff. So, like, it's kind of hard to understand. They say it's supposed to be a, a poem, and, and it, I didn't understand half of it. But I try to read it. I let it, uh, if you love the, the app, because you can just let it read to you. And we'll go through this. But Job, I, I, I feel like I related to him. Now, I don't ever want to think that I had to go through what Job goes through. And we're going to talk about what Job goes through. I'm not even close to that level what he goes through. But Job starts out at the beginning of Job, at the very beginning. He, everything is going well. He's got seven sons. He's got three daughters. He's got a a big flock of animals, he, and that's how they judged you, is how many animals you had, and he had a lot, and things were going good. He was, he was upright, he shunned evil, he feared God, he was blameless, and everybody, um, he, was, he was the greatest man among all the people of the East, is what it says in the Bible. So at the beginning, it was great. That's how I felt. I love my house, I love my job, I love this church, I love where I was at. I, I thought everything was going well. My spray company was doing well. I, I, I thought everything was fine with me. And all of a sudden, things change really quickly. Same with here. Here's what happens. Our, my first little post right here. After, after everything's going good, one day Satan shows up and the angels show up. And in chapter 1, verse 9 through 12 of Job, here's what happens. You know, Satan's been prowling the earth back and forth, as it says in Job, and basically he comes up and says, does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? For, he has ble for you have blessed the work of his hands. You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and his herds have spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand, strike everything he has, and he surely will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. So his first thing happens to him, this first testing of, of Job's faith. And that's what this is all about, his faith. This is the age-old question. Why does bad things happen to good people? When you think you're doing right, when you think you're trying, when you think you're trying to do everything right, and all of a sudden something happens, and you're like, why? What? God, why, what's going on? And I was there, guys. I, I questioned a lot of things. So Job gets tested. His first thing that happens is he loses all of his animals. There's messengers show up. They were feasting. Here's what's crazy about Job. Job was such a righteous man that they would feast and his kids and, and daughters would feast. And then after they'd feast, Job would do a sacrifice because he just wanted to make sure just in case one of his kids had sinned, they would do a sacrifice just in case. That's the type of person Job was, just to make sure at the time. So Job loses his, he loses all of his, all of his animals. Then 
A big windstorm comes. The family's inside, all of his sons and daughters. The house collapses on them, and every one of them die. He loses every one of his sons and every one of his daughters. I don't know what your breaking point is. I don't know when you say enough's enough. I've had enough. I can't do this. I can't handle this. I can't take this anymore. But I know for me, at that moment, when I wasn't ready, I was really close to my breaking point. Job, I think, right at that moment, when you lose, a, lose somebody that you love, a family member, um, a child, that, that pain, that grief, I cannot imagine what that would feel like to lose a person that you love. Here's what Job does. Job replies, um, and he says this, he says, in, in my next one, he says, at this time, he, Job tears his clothes and robes off and shaves his head. Now, that's why I thought I could relate to Job, because he shaves his head, and I thought the same thing. He says, all right, I shaved my head, too. Shaves his head. Then he falls to the ground and worships, and he says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all of this, Job did not sin against the charging God with wrongdoing. He loses everything. Guys, I'm, I'm not that good. I lost one little thing, and, and I, I was saying things that, to God that, Maybe not be right. I was done, and I didn't understand it. And I, I, I was mad. I was frustrated. I was doubting where I was headed, what I was going to be doing. And I don't know if you've ever been there, but I was there two years ago. I was in the middle of it. Job, this isn't enough. This isn't enough because Job doesn't curse God. So Satan comes back again. Let's try this again. And, and Satan says again, he says, come back. We'll test him again. You know, the family and his property, that's one thing. But let's do something to his body. Skin for skin, as Satan says. I tell you this, if I give skin for skin, he surely will curse you. So what happens? He puts boils and diseases all over his body. Pain unbearable. He, it's so bad that he takes a pot in clay and scrapes himself, trying to get the boils off. It's so bad that in Ch Job chapter 2, his own wife says this. Are you still maintaining that integrity you got? Curse God and die. His wife has given up. It said, we have done something wrong. Just curse God and die because that's better than where we're at right now. To lose everything we got, lose all our sons and daughters, lose all our stuff, and now look at you. Your boils, there's things all over you. And he says this, this is right after, this is what amazes me about Job. He replies, you are taking, I'm sorry, you are talking like a foolish woman. This is his wife, I don't know if I could do this. One more time, he replies, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all of this, Job did not sin in what he said, for what he said. So all of these things happen to him, and they do not, they do not, he doesn't curse God. Two different times he gets tested. So back to my story. We moving on. I interviewed for different, a bunch of different spots. Um, eventually, um, we got an opening, an opportunity where my wife prayed that the door opened, that both of us could work at the same spot, that both of us would have an opportunity, we'd be with our kids, just like we were at this, at my previous place. And so... The door opened for Tisha Mingo. Never heard of it, never been there, didn't know anything about it. But here's what we walked into. I walked into a football team that was 0-26. I walked into a football team that had 12 on the football team. I walked into the football team that had no booster club. That's, where I, that, that's what I walked into. Um we get the job offer. They give it to us. We're excited. The very next words that come out of the what? Good luck on finding a house. Good luck on finding a house. So you offer the job. And the housing market down there is extremely hard to find. Basically, here are our options. One rent house that we found, one that we that would be able to get three bedrooms, um, one rent house, or three what I called weed houses. 
because there are $500,000 houses. The houses were terrible, but they had three barns on them all set up for weed. And literally, they were like, hey, three weed houses for sale. And they're like $500,000. So I'm like, mm, new athletic director, I don't know if that's a great idea to buy those. And nor can I fo- afford $500,000. So we chose for a year to rent. And my wife's business finance major, and obviously renting, I know that some people are happy rent, and that's what you do. Uh, but I like we, we've owned our house for most of, most of our lives and what we bought. We bought and sold houses and done very well. God's blessed us in that. And so one day, a year goes by, um, and we're looking for a house. And all of a sudden, my wife calls me and says, hey, come on home. We're, we're buying a house. I said, no, I trust my wife, and I love my wife, and she's very smart. But I'm like, what? We haven't talked about this. We're buying a house. And so she had met the people that lived right next to us. They had a house that literally was um, vacant, but they had a bunch of stuff in it, and it hadn't been lived in in about five or six years. And this lady says, you're a Christian? Oh, you're a Christian? Oh, we just prayed that a Christian would buy this house. We want you all to have it. And they gave us a good deal on it. And, and all of a sudden, Tara's like, yep, we're buying this house. So we bought the house. But here's where, here's where some turmoil comes. What we thought was going to be easy house, all we're going to do is paint the walls, change the floor a little bit, scrape the ceiling. <laughs> nay, nay. As you can see at the top over here, that was all termite damage. We had to rip that whole entire wall out, the whole back wall out. The roof had a leak. We had to replace the whole roof. Air conditioner didn't work. Um, the front part right here, which if you look on this bottom right, that's all termite damage. We had to rip everything out. On top of that, I had to beg Jade McDoulet to come down because there's nobody that would come down in Tishomingo that I could get to work and that I would trust. Jade comes down. We're trying to change out one little light deal. And Jade's a tall guy, if y'all know him. And we're up on a ladder. All of a sudden, a 20-foot section of sheetrock rotted out and just fell on both of us in the middle of all this. And I said, I'm sorry, Jade, because, you know, you don't want Jade mad. She, he may beat you up. Um, you know, I'm like, man, I don't, I'm sorry to mean to, you know. And, and, you know, Jade's like, ha, 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 he's just giggling, you know. He's like, oh, it's okay, man. I'm like, this ain't okay. And that was another turning point. I'm like, what are we doing? This house that I wanted or my wife wanted and we thought, oh, this would be great. Whatever, we'll flip it, make money, and then we'll be able to buy or build whatever we want, blah, 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 turned into the house of horrors. Just one problem after another after another. If you ever flipped a house, I guess you know this. We kind of flipped a house, but this is flipping a house. When you're removing walls and taking walls down and having to, I mean, right in the middle of it, it, it was a lot. Way more money than we wanted to spend. Way more time, way more effort. I was in the middle of it. I, you know, we, we, we were, I was at another breaking point with this house. I, I told Tara, I don't want to spend any more money on this thing. Like, this isn't my dream house. This house doesn't have a driveway. This house doesn't have a garage. This house doesn't have a backyard. Like, it's literally, it's about this wide. And I'm being a little bit sarcastic, but it's about this wide. You got a house right here, house right there. The party house. We literally live right next to Murray College. So the party, you know, where all the kids party on the weekends is right across the street from us. That's the party house. And so we're like, what are we doing with this house? God, I don't understand. I, I go from my dream house to this house. And, and, I mean, working on it day and night. Every time I go to work, come home, it was the next house over, go over, rip something up, try to fix something, change outlets, all the things I was trying to do. Spending money after money. I was tired. I was wore out. It just wasn't working. I felt like I was in a fight. I felt like. Every time I did something, it was like I was fighting, especially this house. So I thought this would be a great picture to bring up. For you, you'll know if you see this next picture. Um, one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, hopefully you guys know Rocky. If you're not, then you're not old enough. If, if not, you kids, you need to watch this. It's a great movie, Rocky IV. This is the Russian. And I felt my life was like Rocky at the time. I felt like I was just a chip on my shoulder. Things were hitting me, and there was nothing I could do about it. Lost my job. This house isn't working. Why are we down here? I lost my church I go to. Lost friends, the group that I was with. Um, and, and I just wasn't seeing. I was very negative. I was, I was looking at all the negatives, and I was done. 
I wore my, this is my Rocky Balboa shirt, by the way, too, so I think it, you know, matched pretty good. I planned this really pretty well. Thought, I've always thought the Russian, you know, he's a, he's a pretty big dude to fight, and Rocky seems to always overcome, and some t- somehow at the very end, Rocky, sin, sin, you know, ends up winning. But that's the way I felt. That's the way I felt my life was. I was just getting punched and punched and punched, and I'm like, God, why? What, what, what am I doing wrong? I was going to church. I was trying. I was probably playing church more than I was going to church. I was frustrated, and I didn't understand what was going on at the time. I was ready to give up, and I didn't know what to do. This next slide shows you the things that I was doing. I'm not saying this is you if you're quitting or frustrated, but this is what I was doing. On this side, I was being too hard on myself. My wife said it. My mom said it. People were saying, you're just too hard on yourself. Scott, you got to get over it. Scott, you got to move on. Scott, you got to grow up. Scott, quit being selfish. I was selfish because I wanted a bigger house. I wanted a nicer yard. I wanted bigger things. I was being selfish. I was making excuses because I didn't truly understand why I was being let go of my job, so I just made excuses of maybe I didn't do this, maybe I didn't do this, maybe I didn't do this, maybe I should have done that, maybe I could have done this, if we would have won more, whatever. I was coming with all the excuses. I was comparing people in this church. Of, Man, look where he's at. Look what he's doing. Look what she's doing. They got a great wife, a great family, and that's what I was doing. You got to quit comparing. So that's what I had to tell myself. I had to quit making excuses. I had to quit being selfish. I had to quit complaining. I had to quit being negative, being around negative people, because in this society, in this world today, it's better just to be negative. It's easier to quit and give up than it is to fight through. As I tell my kids this all the time on the football team, it's way easier to quit than it is to show up to Summer Pride, lift weights, run when it's hot. It's way easier. As a guy, we struggle. You got a wife, you got kids, you got bills, you got all that stuff. And it's like, man, there's times where you're just like, man, I'm just tired and wore out. How do I keep pushing through? How do I keep doing this? How do I get this strength? I mean, obviously, there's an easy answer, but sometimes that answer, you're like, man, God, I've, I've said this before, and I ain't hearing nothing. And that's the way I felt. I played the victim card, and then I was afraid to fail. I felt when I got to Tishomingo my first year, I was like, man, I lost the first game. I was like, is he going you know, to let me go? Is this going to happen? I was freaking out. I lost 26 pounds my first season because I was stressed. Didn't know what was going to happen. Didn't know if he was going to bring me in his office and say, hey, I appreciate it, but it just didn't work out. I didn't know. And so that's what I was doing. We won one game, and so Tishomingo people had my first year. that We won one, but we got off of that 0-26, so they were all happy. We were 1-29. Now, I know you total guys are like, what? what? We're 29 and one. <laughs> but go to some other places, it's not always that easy. And sometimes you're like, man, how how's it come easy for some and come hard for others? I don't know. And I felt like everything I've had to do is go through the hard way. Um, then this is what I had to start doing. Oh, I'm sorry. You can go back one more quick recap. This is what I had to start doing. I had to start praying more. I had to start thinking and crying out to God. And I did. I cried out to God. I mean, I fought with God. God, I'm here. Here's where I'm at. L- Lord, you got to give me strength. Lord, you got to show me. Lord, you got to you got to tell me, explain to me what's going on. Cuz I didn't know. I'd ask my wife. My wife reads the Bible all the time, like literally every single day, and I'm like, "Are you hearing something or what, you know?" And 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 I just felt like nothing was going on at the time. I started reading the Bible, not social media. I don't have really social media. I don't have Facebook or anything like that. Except MySpace. Twitter, Glitter, any of those things. Um, I did get TikTok a couple weeks ago um, just because I was looking up something and then you had to like actually log on to get to TikTok to get it. But but I really don't have social media because I don't think a lot of times it's good and it, it gets you down rabbit holes and negative. Um, I had to find some people that could help me. And I'll be honest, and I don't know how you guys felt, but at the time, the one person was crazy even now. The person that I felt I was betrayed and hurt the most was my previous boss, and God opens up the door for my new boss to be the person to help me through what I was going through. Let me explain that one more time. My boss that said, I'm done with you, and I lost faith and trust in the people that were leading me, God revealed to me my next boss is the guy that has helped me through some of my problems. We go to church together. He leads the church. I'm helping with the youth. We work together every single day. We hang out together. And this guy's helped me through my problems. God sent me him. 
Now, some people may love him. Some people may. No one's perfect. None of us are perfect. But I felt like God has used him to help me to build trust back into my bosses and my the people that are leading me. I love both of my bosses, my principal and my superintendent. But what I got to realize is just showing up sometimes. Showing up. And I know you said, if you show up, you're not quitting. If you can look up, you can get up. All football terms, all coaching terms. You're going to get knocked down. and life's, gonna, life's hard. Life's hard for all of us. There ain't nobody in this room that's immune to being, life being hard and things we got to go through. Every one of you. And I know some of you are going through stuff right now. It ain't easy. And you're getting punched, and you don't know where it's coming from, and you don't know what to do, and you don't know what to do next. Sometimes the only thing you can do is show up and say, God, I'm still here. I'm crying. I don't know what's going on, God, but I need you because I can't do this anymore. I don't know what you're leading me to do. I don't know. But I can't do this by myself anymore. I need you. And those are the things I had to do to start changing. I don't know if that relates to you at all, but that's what I had to do in these last two years to try to get over what I felt like was a major hit in my life. I said this. My next my next slide. My house is pretty much done. I kept working. We kept working. People like Jade, my friends, people would show up. My mom asked me just the, uh, asked me this yesterday. She said, hey, do, hey, Scott, do you got any grass in your front yard yet? So I had no grass in my front yard, none. It was like bare desert. If you can look at it, it's actually grass. I grew my own grass, and it's, I was proud of myself. Gra- the grass, if you can see, like it's an actual living room. The walls aren't caving in. A bathroom and a shower to go to the, I can shower. And what I realized is this is all I need. I don't have to have 2,700 square foot, four bedroom, two bath swimming pool, two acres and a barn. I don't. God gave me exactly what I needed. And luckily because of this now, I'm like, hey, I got a nice place. Back bedroom's nice. So God started doing these things and helping me see hey, I'm at where I'm supposed to be, doing what I'm supposed to be doing, and he showed me little by little what all these things are. And this is what happens. This is what I'm going to finish with. In Job's story, back to Job, he obviously gets tested. He obviously has a lot of pain and turmoil that goes through. He never denounces God. He never curses God. He keeps his faith strong. What would it be like? I mean, if everything was perfect and everything... I mean, who would really call on God? You know, sometimes we say, oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. When, you know, when things are going great, praise him. Maybe we do. Sometimes I'm more reluctant. I know whenever things are bad, I sure do call out on them. But that's when your faith is produced. That's when we figure out where we're at. So to finish the story of Job today, you, you know, he has these three friends show up. And again, when you're, in, when you're in need, we all need friends. We need people to help us. We need people to help us when we're down and when we're out. And when you think, man, that's it. I can't get up anymore. I can't handle this anymore. you got to have somebody come in. And he, he did. He had three people show up. But sadly, if you read the stories of those three friends, they started saying, well, you must have done something wrong, Job. You must have done something. I don't know why God's cursed you this bad, man, but you did something. You're probably lying to us, but you, you, your family, somebody did something to deserve all this. And during the whole time, he said, no, I didn't. I believe in God, and I believe this is right. And he just kept staying steadfast. And so here's what happens in chapter, chapter 42, verses 12 and 13. Job's restored. It says this in tw- uh, verse 12. So the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life, even more than the beginning. For now he has 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 team of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys, and he also gave Job seven more sons and three more daughters. Now this is a great ending. Unbelievable story. I know some of you might be in the middle of it, and, and you don't know what the ending is. But I do want to tell you what God's done for me in the last two years. So here's where I'm at today. I've changed where I work. I change where I live. I change the church I go to. 
and I've been upset and negative about looking at all that. This ain't where I want to be. This ain't that. It's easy to look at the negative. It's easy to say why this should have, could have, would have. Or I can start looking at the positive. And I wrote down just a few. I got more than this, but I got a few that I want to write, that I want to tell and share with you guys today. First of all, first thing was we found a house that we could afford that we can pay off in 10 years. That house that we got, we're going to pay it off in 10 years. We got it before the interest rates went up. So like our interest rates, like 2.3% interest on a 10-year note. Because we bought below our means, we can pay that thing off now in less than nine years. That's God's doing. Because we would have waited three more months and went up the interest rates up to 6.4, 6.5. That's God's doing. Us finding a house, being able for it to work. Second thing he did, I'm making more money right now than I did at this school that's twice the size. I've been given a title, um, which doesn't matter a whole bunch, but I've been given a title of working as an athletic director, and I've been getting paid more money than I did at the other school. I was at last season at Tishomingo was the best football season they had in 10 years. We had 40 kids come out for football right now. We just got back a week ago from the University of Arkansas where we were invited for a seven-on-seven camp and an uh, O-line and D-line camp. My wife, unbelievable. In two years, she's had three promotions. That's not normal. First, year, first when we got there, she's going to be a fifth-grade math teacher. She was happy, excited. That was great. A week before school started, she, she has her master's degree. She said, can you be a counselor? She said, yes, I can. Was a counselor for a year. Did great there. Mr. Waitman saw her um, finance, de finance degree, said, hey, I want you to move to central office. Move to central office. She does the finances. Now she's my boss and my boss. And my boss. So, like, literally all my times I have to buy something for athletics, I have to give it to her. And when I don't do something right, you didn't sign this. You didn't put the date on there. I love my wife. But she gets that. And then this year, for you that have been in the education world, she has moved up again. Now she is basically HR over all paychecks, over all insurance, over everything. $8 million, I think, is what it is. My wife's over that. In three years, or I mean two years, she's had three promotions. That's a God thing. I, don't, I mean, I'm not saying that hasn't happened to any other people. Maybe it has, but I've never heard of that doing amazing things next my fifth thing all my girls are doing great in school they all three all three of them play a sport when i was at my previous school i would have bet a million dollars none of them would have played a sport ever they just weren't, i didn't think they were into it they didn't want to do it i didn't want to push them they weren't into sports now all three of them play sports not only do all three play sports they all got straight a's that ain't for me if you know me <laughs> it's like that ain't for me that's from their mom okay but they got, they got straight A's. And I'm not trying to boast. I'm trying to tell you what God's done to show me where I was and where we're at now. I help, I, um, my sixth thing, I'm helping with the new church. I'm helping with the youth. I've been preaching. Uh, and just last month, I was asked to be an elder. God has been showing me this is the way and part of his plan for me and my family right now. Things that change all the time. Our lives change all the time. It's up and down. Every, every way around. I think Satan's on the prowl. He's always looking to devour something. But there's one thing that stays the same is God. God never changes. He stays the same today as he will tomorrow and forever. I want to share with you this my favorite Bible. It's always been, Tony knows this, it's always been my favorite Bible verse. It's in the New Testament, James. I, I recommend if you haven't read the Bible, don't like reading the Bible, James is a great one. It's fast, it's short, it's very straightforward, and it's very practical. It's very practical. And it says this, James chapter 1, verse 2 and 4, through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so you may be mature, complete, and lacking in nothing. I'm still immature. I don't have all the answers right right now. Where God's taking me, where I'm headed, what I'm doing. I couldn't believe I'm up here speaking. From a kid that stuttered when I was in high school, was a special needs IEP kid, to taking the principal's test 11 times, 
failing it 11 times and finally passing it. One of the things I wasn't given is I'm stubborn, just like my mom and my grandpa. Yeah. For you, I don't know where you're at. Maybe you're thinking, I need to throw my hands up, throw the towel in, I'm done. Maybe you could sit back. I know this is hard to do, and I'm just telling you because I've, I, I went through some things the last couple of years. It's hard to step back and say, God, what are you doing with me right now? What, what are you trying to show me? What are you trying to put into me? And that's what, guys, sometimes our faith, that's when our faith is strong. That's when, when we are weak, he is strong. When we are down, he lifts us up. When you're down, other people come. That's what I love about this church. When you walk in, you always feel welcomed. There's always somebody showing up saying hi, and you feel like home. All of us play sometimes. I know A said it earlier when we finished, and as we finish up, we, we sometimes we play church. We don't realize that there are people in these pews that are hurting. We're down. The church, that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be the church, be people that help each other. If it's financially, if it's praying, if it's building a fence, if it's whatever, that's what the church is supposed to be. And when people are down and out, you're praying. That's what the, I don't know if you know this, but people before before anybody walks in this building, people are praying for everybody that's coming in this church. They've been doing it for years. There's a lady that left. Her name's Carrie. She's been praying for me to accept Jesus when I was 16 years old. That's how that's how consistent people are at this church. That's why I love this church. And I pray right now for every one of you guys. Let's finish praying right here, Lord. I pray right now, and I thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to be up here, Lord. Thank you that you've shown me things. Lord, but I pray right now for somebody in this audience, somebody that's struggling, somebody that's going through something, somebody that is down and out and is ready to throw in the towel and says, I've had enough. Lord, Job is a great story. It's a, it's a great way to remind us going through tough times when you're hurting and you feel like you're doing everything you can. And showing that perseverance in those trials and, and learning and growing from them. I would say this right now, Lord, if you're there still breathing, there's still time. There's time to repent. There's time to be forgiven. There's time to, to, to learn and grow. And that you ain't, you're not done with them, Lord. If they're still here, there's time for them to do something. And Lord, I pray right now that if anybody's in this room and they, 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 they're just broken, they're done. That somebody, that you give them the strength, that somebody comes in their life to help them, that they don't make mistakes, they don't, they don't make excuses, they're not negative, but Lord, that they try to learn and grow from this experience, whatever they're going through. Everyone deals with things differently. We know that in the last two years. But Lord, I just pray right now that they know that there's open arms. You're there waiting for them to come and just say, here I am, give all my burdens. I don't, I'm not perfect. I don't know it all, and all I got to do is show up, and God, take care of the rest. I'm so thankful that you know, and you have a plan that's better than all of us. Sometimes we don't understand it. Sometimes it's really hard to understand what we're doing. But, Lord, you got us and protect us. Lord, thank you so much for this time. Watch over everybody, Watch over everybody Lord. Let us have a great 4th of July. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He's worthy of every song we could ever sing. And worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes and wonder it.
and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me and your love to those around me. He's worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could. 